training facility where we talk about fighting training and events it's the fight mixer show where you can hear about all the local and world combat sports happenings get ready it's time to gear up and square up because we're going live live on the fight mixer show Gabe, what's going on, brother? How you doing? Greetings and salutations. Not bad. What's going on? Nothing too much. So, just a brief disclaimer. We're talking about this before the show aired. Like, Gabe was on the show before he was a co-host. He was actually on the show as a guest. But I was just like, holy shit. Like, what questions do I ask him? And like, I had all these questions planned. Like, row by row by row by row. I was going to ask him all these like detail questions and it was just like a christmas story when ralphie finally meets santa claus and then i was like oh god what, what am i gonna fucking ask him and they're like football yeah football and i was sliding down the slide i was like no i want a very right or beat gun so i had all these questions and i missed them all and now we're gonna make up for it so i can't wait <laughs> i'm at it proceed yeah. all right so a couple disclaimers <laughs> ali's gonna add in questions or own feedback uh she's gonna throw in some questions throw in some comments uh, to the questions that I asked. She's also going to ask questions herself. Uh, I have Wikipedia, so I broke my own cardinal rule. Yeah. Wait, what yeah. Was it? Yeah. No. Sally breaking up? Signal, so we know we're going back up here. Perfect. Okay. So, lay down a couple ground okay. rules. I have Wikipedia at uh, Gabriel's career, uh, just to add like a timeline. I'm also going to bring up some subject matters in the sport of mixed martial arts during one of the greatest errors, one of the most interesting controversial errors in MMA. Is that right, Gabe? Uh, I mean, it's definitely an interesting era. I, I think uh, – I, I, now, I will say that it did start I, – I, like, so I started uh, – my first time was in 02, so, I mean, like, I think 94 was the first UFC, so there there is definitely a, a prior history. But uh, the time frame going into it, I, I got to, to see the wave – from when it was illegal, then it became pseudo famous into the behemoth it is today. So yeah, good opportunity to to to, to veer uh, or not veer, but to, to watch the the the, the rise of, of uh, MMA. Right. So are we all ready to begin? Ali, Pro- are you ready? Yes. <laughs> Dude, are you ready? All right. Can you oh. hear me? I was going to fucking start. All right. So let's start off at the top. Let's start off when Gabe became a legend. At Gabe, birth. Gabe, you? Gabe was born, brought into the world. You start karate when you were seven years old. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. Uh, Wikipedia is wrong. Um, really? I did hip keto. I did hip keto as a kid. Uh, and then I did kung fu as a teenager. Yep. Right. When, when, when did you, how did you get involved with mixed martial arts? Because Shudo didn't start until 1986, and UFC didn't start until 1993 with Pancras starting in 1993 as well. So how'd you get involved with mixed martial arts or martial so, arts itself? So in high school, I'm doing Kung Fu, and this friend of mine, Sean's like, you got to come over to my house. You got to come watch this thing. It's the most crazy thing ever. And I'm a, I'm a big martial arts fan. I've been my entire life. Uh, I've watched Kung Fu Theater, uh, Bruce Lee. I mean, uh, actually, uh, Steven Seagal and, and John claude Van Damme were all like, when I was growing up a kid, like just like the action heroes that I really enjoyed watching and everything. Uh, and so I go to my friend Sean's house and I think we watched UFC. I want to, I believe it was four. I think it was when, when uh, uh, Hoist fought uh, Dan Severn. That's, I think that's the correct card. Um, and it was the most insane thing I'd ever seen in my life. 
uh, and I went to my Kung Fu sensei and I go, um, what do you know about grappling? And he lost his mind. He, what? That, that, that grappling shit is just fucking, he's like, Kung Fu Sansu has got anti-grappling. All right, everyone, and I'm a, you know, I'm a young kid and he, he's losing his mind. And, and, and mind you, he looks like Dave Mustaine from Megadeth. Like this big, tall, like blonde haired, just like Kung Fu guy. Uh, and he, he circles up the class and shows his shows an anti grappling movement. And I'm just like, I'm 16 or 17, and like, I just think it's bullshit. And I'm sorry, I just think it's bullshit. Um, now, obviously, I didn't say that to him. And I, I uh, and then uh, I, I went away, uh, moved to San Francisco, and uh, um, uh, I got a, I, I was 18, I got a tattoo. And my tattoo artist, uh, Troy Denning, he uh, had a Rick Gracie D in his studio. And I'm like, oh, you train jujitsu? Because at this point, I had bought in every video that I could get my hands on, and you know, I I was a massive fan. Uh, and he goes, yeah, I trained with Hal Gracie, and I was like, oh my god, I know exactly who that is. I had seen the extreme fighting tapes, and uh, Hal, unlike Hoist, didn't wear a gi, and he and he threw a lot of punches and was just a really an animal. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, I want to come training, so he sent me in, and uh, I got beat up my very first day by a little Filipino guy. And I go, how long have you been training for? He's like six months. And I go, I need to learn this shit. So I, I at the time, I was going to, to, to college and working full time. And uh, I started uh, the way that I, I the way that the way it was set up is you uh, you you paid uh, the, the lowest tier was a hundred dollars a month, but that got you one class a week. So you basically had four classes a month. Um, and I came in on Monday and I trained my Monday and then I, I thought like, you know what, I may not be able to, to go and actually do the other classes, but I can probably sit and watch them. So, um, I sat and I, I came in every other day. Uh, and, uh, after the second week, they're like, you know, what, why are you, why, why aren't you training? And I go, well, I, I, I did my one class on Monday and I can't train anymore. And they're like, just get on the fucking mat. And then I really fell in love with uh, fighting and jiu-jitsu. And uh, I was, there was a place called Japan Video in, uh, in San Francisco. And they had everything. They had the IVCs. They had the Russian tournaments. And I would go there every day and I'd, I'd rent two or three VHS videos. Uh, and uh, it was all I wanted to do was just train. And uh, it ruined my life because I quit going to college and just so I could train more jujitsu. And it wasn't that I, I wasn't like, this is what I'm gonna do for a career. It was more just like, I just love doing this. Um, right. And I trained for about four years and I started doing kickboxing at uh, Fairtex and uh, a place called uh, Team USA. And I did four or five kickboxing fights and then a, a, a San Chow tournament. Um, went to Japan for a month and a half uh, train with some of the, the, the top guys there. Uh, and I, I was able to hang with them. And I'm like, okay, let me see if I can fight. And I took a fight. Uh, it was WBC, I think, five or six, actually. Um, uh, a buddy of mine set it up for me. And uh, I fought a guy who had already had, like, 15 fights. And I, I don't care. Sure, I just wanted to test to see if I could do it. Uh, I fought. I got knocked out. And uh, I go, I want to do it again. I'm going to do it again. I fought a third, a second time. Uh, won that fight pretty easily. Uh, and for whatever reason, it, I got the, the, the bite. And that's all I wanted to do. And, uh, yeah, I did, I think, an 11 or 12-year career, which is uh, insane. But, yeah, that was the beginning, the very beginning, 2002. So I have a question for both you and Ali. And Ali, from a fan perspective, and like me, I have my own opinion, and to Gabe. So, like, the first UFC won. So you watched the first couple of UFCs, and, you know, Hicks and Gracie was heavily involved because, you know, the whole concept of UFC was born from the Gracie Challenge. It was widely Boy. available. It would bring people in, like, and Gracie would just fucking dolly wop all of them. So UFC won. That was, like, the concept. And also a bunch of executives circled around the fucking Mortal Kombat arcade machines. Like, yeah, we got to bring that to national television. And, you know, they got away with it, too, because, you know, I, I think America had, like, a hunger for violence because Mike Tyson was in jail, so he's no longer killing people. And WWE, like, pro wrestling was kind of, like, on, like, a downturn. So the pro wrestling biz was out. So I think people were craving a new sort of entertainment. But with Hickson Gracie evolved, 
with the first beginning UFCs. And Hoist. yeah, Hoist. Hoist. well, Hicks and Gracie was behind the scenes. Like he was, he was like, oh, okay. Hicks and yeah. yeah, yeah. And they said Hicks and Gracie. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. So like Hicks and Gracie, <laughs> Hicks and Gracie behind the scenes. Hoist Gracie, the smallest guy of the bunch, fighting everybody. He cuts through the competition like hot fucking butter. So he in the tournament, like UFC one, there were no like Olympic wrestlers, no uh, collegiate wrestlers, no other jiu jitsu black belts. It was just Hoist Gracie. The only thing close to having a ground game was Ken Shamrock. Like, and obviously you caught the bug, and that's what made you want to go into jiu jitsu. Do you feel that the first beginning UFCs were less of a competition and more just a big giant fucking infomercial for great jiu jitsu? Uh, well, so Ali, you want you want to hit yours first, then I'll give you my opinion. Yeah, because mine's not going to be very extensive. Uh, I just feel like back then, like, they were just tough fucking dudes. Like, they wouldn't be, like, bitch slapping around now, but technique they have now would have definitely just smoked the whole fucking game. Like, those guys were still tough, but, like, they're just tough fucking dudes. Because I remember we had a gym, and it wasn't very technical, and we started getting guys that did a jujitsu camp. Which back then, like, nobody took jujitsu, and they just murdered everybody after that. Once they just learned, like, on a couple weeks worth of jujitsu training, that was it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, it was actually Horian who was, who was running things in the background, not Hickson. But um, oh. Horian expressly set it up perfectly, um, and he ensured that they, that they they picked people that would uh, ensure that his brother got the the you know the best matches. And um, I do feel that in a lot of ways it was an infomercial for jujitsu and an exceptional one. I mean, like to this day. You know the Gracie name holds so much weight, um, a lot of weight, and uh, um, I thought it was a brilliant, brilliant idea um, for him to, to do it that way. But I mean, they've been doing the Gracie challenge. Uh, there's those videos from they, they've been doing that in their gym. You know, they would do challenge matches in their gym. Uh, so they 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 kind of knew that this would was what was going to work and and be efficient. Especially that, look, I was doing like I I came from traditional martial arts. I did kung fu. And uh, uh, my, my Kung Fu sensei had me believing that this was the most deadly thing ever, that I was doing Kung Fu Sensu and that it was the baddest martial art on the planet. And if I hit somebody, I would kill them. I genuinely believe that. Um, but one thing that I appreciated about Jiu-Jitsu versus that was I learned the first day that what I knew didn't mean anything. Um, and uh, the, the, efficient, uh, the, the efficiency, efficiency of Jiu-Jitsu um, is, I mean, you know, it, it uh, changed in my Opinion. I think if you ask any historian, uh, they changed the, the 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 dynamic of martial arts as we know it to this day. Right. So so and and we also talked about you finding amateur fights. So like we also talked briefly about John McCain in the nineties and how he got banned across states and taken off pay per view. So yeah. John McCain, I, I felt was very uh, hypocritical. I, I on one side I felt that he helped evolve the sport, but on another side I felt like you know it was. It, it was uh, there was a lot of misconceptions that drove John McCain to get the government to be on MMA's ass like fucking hemorrhoids. Like when you, when the government's on your ass, like there's there's no coming back from that. It's like betting against the house; the house always wins. Like, but John McCain was also at a boxing fight. Like he says how unsafe it was, but John McCain was also at a boxing fight when somebody died. I think it was in '95 or '96. He also said that like it was un-American to hit someone on the ground, but I heard. I looked up. I googled. He said nothing about Ron and King. You know, like I think, like did <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. So, like, my question is: was was UFC and MMA marketed incorrectly, and that's the reason why it was taken off pay per view? Was it unsafe because you also said yourself that you were blown away by it, or did you know? <sighs> Hold on, I got the right question. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. So, like, did, did you feel – now I got the question. I'm sorry. So, like, did you feel that it was just marketed incorrectly? Uh, did the government not know how to regulate it correctly? Or was it just unsafe and, you know, John McCain had a point? Or Because I, I I don't get it. I, I really don't get why he took it off. I, I see why in hindsight, but what do you think, Gabe? Well, I mean, you, the, the, you got to think of the time frame. And, and the first UFCs had – as little rules as possible. You could groin strike, you grab the hair. Uh, I mean, well, you have like just just optics. The very first fight they had uh, was that 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 uh, I think the Savat fighter versus the uh, uh, sumo wrestler. And the sumo wrestler gets kicked in the face and his teeth fall out of his mouth. Um, 
the optics of that makes it very easy to be like, no, that's extremely dangerous and it's really, really bad and someone's going to die. Um, I, my personal feeling is that John McCain was looking for a a, a small niche in his, his uh, political belt and he was going after something that didn't have any real weight as far as uh, what's, concern, uh, what's concerning the American people, but he did it to put that little piece into his political belt. That's my personal feeling. What do you think, Ali? I, I mean, I agree with that because I remember the same thing kind of happened in Iowa. Uh, I want to say it's 2010 is when they cracked down. And at first they said they were going to do away with all amateur fighting, which ended up happening was they regulated, which was good. But they were telling us that it was all going to end. There wasn't going to be a lot of any events because what happened was some 18-year-old kid signed up and the event that he went to gave him a title holder and he broke his arm. And the kid actually wasn't even petitioning it. It was his parents. And he had actually wrote a letter saying, I did this on my own choice. I knew the consequences and I feel like I can face those consequences. I do not think amateur fighting needs to be shut down, but whatever, you know, what happened to me was unfortunate. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was something going on in the state at the round at the same time. And we all kind of figured this was a huge distraction to try and get people focused away from the big source. Yeah. Got it. So obviously you fought in the UFC game and you worked with uh, Dana White. So let's talk about Dana White just for two seconds. Okay. So the late nineties, early two thousands, Dana White would quit his lucrative job as a box aerobics instructor because he was a box aerobics instructor, right? Yeah. That's, that's what he did. Yeah. Right. And he was also a marathon runner from the mob, right? Uh, I mean, you know, Dana has a story. I, I don't know how much, uh, uh, legitimacy in is in that, but um, I, you know what, uh, Dana has, has done an he did an exceptional job by befriending the Fujita brothers, uh, who were who were you know uh, massive uh, uh, casino magnets, uh, and he got them to invest in in the business. And that's what a lot of people like 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 if Dana White was the one that Dana just pressed his 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 wealthy friends to 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 invest in a business, um, and I look I gave him all the credit in the world for it and. He's become the face of, uh, of the UFC. Even where now, when people like, like they, they go to Dana, Dana doesn't, like, like they talk about matchups, they have matchmakers. You know what I mean? Like, why, why like, Sean Shelby does the matchmaking, but they, they yell at Dana. And uh, even from my understanding, is even now, Dana doesn't have nearly the power that he wants to. People think that he's a figurehead and he's paid as a figurehead. But look, I give him all the credit in the world. He's, uh, he, uh, for his job, uh, he has been a very, very good uh, as the spokesman for the UFC in an, an exceptional job. So he 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 started managing like uh, like the story has it and rumor and innuendo. He goes into a jiu-jitsu class for John Lewis. And have you ever met John Lewis, by the way? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what do you think about John Lewis? And how come his UFC career never panned out? Because he was a bad motherfucker. He cornered Chuck Liddell for a while, cornered Tito. How come his UFC career never reached the heights that you know he he was a bad cat? Well, I John lives out here now and, and uh, is doing acting and doing uh, I think stunt work and things like that. Um, I, I you know what John even had a uh, he had the WFA. If you, uh, you you're a historian of, of uh, MMA, so you should know about the WFA, uh, which was actually a really fun, cool event uh, that I watched a couple uh, fights with. It was really really good fun events. Um, John, uh, you know John was was. Uh, uh, he was kind of a pariah in the jiu-jitsu scene for a while because he fought Carlson Gracie Jr. Uh, in extreme fighting, which kind of put him on, you know, like on the on the, the bad guy list of the Gracie family. Um, but uh, uh, John, I mean, John fought in the UFC multiple times. Uh, I think I think when Jens knocked him out was kind of uh, the deciding factor that, uh, you know, I, I don't know what, what happened after that. The last fight I can remember of John Lewis fighting was he fought Jens in the UFC and got knocked out. So, um, but um, okay. then he went into the promoting game. But yeah, awesome. Okay, so and, and Dana White has dabbled before. Like uh, he was a manager of uh, Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell when the yeah. UFC was in financial peril. He also little little nerd facts. He also was one of the first sponsors of Floyd Money Mayweather when Floyd Mayweather got out of the Olympics in '96. He was actually a sponsor of Floyd Mayweather. It was a little fucking nerdy fact, but I did not know that. Yeah, it, it's crazy. It was like Burr Bench or some type of fucking sponsor name. I have no idea, but nevertheless, he did sponsor. So, you know, it's foreshadowing of events to occur between 
yeah. Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather. But um, nevertheless, so it, UFC is in financial peril. He tried to negotiate Tito Ortiz's contract, and then they buy UFC for like one million or two million dollars. Dollars, but I like was four, I believe it was four million. Four million. Well, I I don't care. I don't I, I don't know the numbers. I do know that I do know that one of the Fertitta brothers was on the athletic commission, and when multiple people tried to get it legalized in Nevada, it didn't go through. And then when the Fertittas bought the UFC, immediately the athletic commission said, "Yes, we're going to let it happen and we're going to sanction it." It was only sanctioned in New Jersey at that point, right? And yeah. It got sanctioned uh, by New Jersey State Athletic Commission, and they got a temp license. And like we're, we're jumping ahead, but that's okay. So get away, God, temp license. You know, it's okay. New, New Jersey State Athletic Commission, thanks to one of the guys on the Athletic Commission being an avid martial artist and a fan who actually got it. So they regulated yeah. the rules and everything like that. Um, the first event under the Zupa banner was at Trump Taj Mahal. And Tito Ortiz would beat like a much smaller Evan Tanner in the main event. Jens Pulver would beat Carlo Uno in your weight class for the belt. So what was your opinion – Talk about Jake Paul. So what was your opinion? You know, it's 2001. It's a year before your pro debut. Uh, were yeah. you watching, the like, the first events in New Jersey? Like, were you tape trading? Were you finding a way to watch these events? Or were you keeping up in the MMA scene to see your weight class and also see what was going down? Well, I first off, it wasn't my weight class. I didn't – I had no no idea that I was going to, to fight professionally. That was never anything that I thought about. But – um. I was a massive fan, and I mean, so I, I, I uh, was talking about this earlier, and uh, someone's bringing up uh, the Jake Paul thing. I have no problem bringing up that piece of shit later, uh, but <laughs> let's, let's just proceed with what we're going at right now. Um, uh, we would go to – I'd watch every event that was possible. I remember watching uh, uh, Tito Ortiz versus uh, Frank Shamrock uh, at, at, a, at a sports bar. There's one sports bar in the entire uh, city of San Francisco uh, that would have, would have events. Um, and we watched it there. Um, I, I, I would watch, I, I, I was such a fan that I would, anything I could get my hands on, I would get a hold of. And if there was an event, I would absolutely watch the event. Um, uh, I watched basically anything that I could. And again, this is pre-internet. So it wasn't, uh, like I said, I, I would say that, that the number one place was Japan video. That place had everything. And, uh, that was kind of my go-to, uh, but if there was an event that was being being uh, televised, we would watch it live. Me and I, I, all the guys from House Gracie's team, we would go. It was like a big deal for us to go watch these fights. Um, but so yeah, as far as like all the fights that they they had, uh, any anything that they had televised, we were watching them. Right, and, and UFC's return to pay per view was September two thousand one, and as history would show, that was the second worst thing to happen to America in September two thousand one. I mean. <laughs> UFC victory in Vegas was a terrible event, but not, you know, the September 11th attacks and everything like that. Where were you during the attacks and where were you at the stage of your life and in your career? Okay. Well, so we watched uh, my, my, my friend, uh, 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 Rob and Kathy went to their house to watch the UFC event. And you are right. It was a very bad event. Uh, and, uh, Vladi Matashenko was a good close friend of mine, took the fight against Tito Ortiz because someone backed out. I don't remember who backed out. But, uh, Vitor Belfort. Vitor Belfort. Uh, okay. Now, the one thing I was actually impressed with about that fight is that, that Tito out-wrestled Vladi because Vladi it was such a gangster wrestler at that point. And it was a boring, boring fight. But the fact that he was able to do that was kind of impressive. 9-11, um, uh, I was actually uh, in I, – I got up for work. I was uh, I was working at a hospital at the time. And I, I woke up and uh, I actually turned on the news and – they were talking about the first tower and I watched the second tower actually get hit. And uh, I had just gotten out of the Coast Guard maybe three months prior to that. And so I called my duty station. I said, are we being activated? What's happening? They're like, we have no idea what's happening. We'll call you if we need you. But, you know, as of right now, uh, you're on just a standby uh, basis. And that was uh, – I never got called up for that. But, um, yeah, that was 9-11, which was very, very intense to actually watch – the second tower hit the hit the building was unbelievable. Right. So so yeah. UFC not being successful and and by the way, a little tidbit on 9-11, United 93, the one plane that did not make its destination, Jeremy Glick, Judica national champion, was on that plane that helped take the plane down. So, you know, if MMA can tip their hat, and obviously it's a thing of pride, but if MMA can tip their hat for one person, you know, it's 
Jeremy Glick, who was a judo national champion, who was on that plane to help bring the plane down. But nevertheless, the uh, UFC victory in Vegas, you know, the, the pay-per-view did like about 75,000 buys. And from uh, September 2001 to January 2002, the buys would go from 75K all the way down to like, I think it was like 30K or like the audience wasn't buying. Do you think that people were just not in the mood to invest again? Because, it, it, you know, making a second impression to the UFC, do you think it just wasn't branded correctly, wasn't marketed correctly? Um, it's, people just weren't buying or just wasn't in the mood to embrace this new sport with everything going on? It's difficult. Um, I, I think that when, when they made that first foray into to, uh, pay-per-view and it was kind of a sinker, uh, I think that like so like for anytime you want to want to start something new, you want it to you want it to be an explosion. You want it to come out the gate hot, right? Um, and unfortunately, it was not. It was very lackluster. Um, and I think that that probably had a, a good part of it. Um, and then you you know then you're doing kind of a rebuilding after that. Um, uh, you know, I, I I kind of watched the evolution. I went to a lot of live live events and. Uh, um, Pre uh, Ultimate Fighter, uh, and it seemed like even before the Ultimate Fighter, there was this this slow buildup of. Uh, I mean, the events were good, and I was talking about um, at that time frame. Actually, uh, the WFA, the John Lewis uh, uh, promotion, they they had it great to where you go to Vegas and you would go to the UFC one night, then the next night would be WFA, and it was like a fight weekend, and it was a lot of fun, and uh, uh, you kind of felt that there was there was a little bit of energy, and but it wasn't like it was going to be. Um, but I, the, the, I will say this, that, 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 that the core fans that were there from the beginning are the most fanatical and amazing fans. And uh, a group of – now, I can distinctly remember uh, going to a UFC fight and listening to some dipshit tell his buddy that uh, it was Gan McGee versus someone. I can't remember who else he, he was fighting, but I distinctly remember that fight. He was like, my buddy, my buddy Bubba, he beat some guy up and threw him on a couch just like that, bitch. And we're sitting there like, these guys are UFC fans, but we had no idea that there would be more. And they, that group of people would just keep growing and growing and growing. Uh, and the group, grass groups would, 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 would be dying off. But you still felt the synergy. There was definitely – there was going to be a buildup. But, I mean, obviously, we didn't think it would be what it is ever what it is today. Do you have like a little bit of envy that you were in it on the rise and not when it already had peaked? I, you know what? Uh, no, I. The, the, the reality is, when I go back to the reason why I fought the first time, I did it because I was terrified of fighting. I didn't do it because I wanted to be famous. I didn't do it because I wanted to be a badass. I didn't do it. I did it because it was something that terrified me. I I was exhilarated watching it, and there was a certain terror of doing it. Um, so for me, actually, to be honest, the, the ultimate fighter, I think, was the worst thing that ever happened to me because I got it in my head that I, I, I was like, oh, I'm going to be famous and I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that instead of the real reason why I fought in the first place. Um, I think that the, I think that the, 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 the fame and money, in my personal opinion, ruins the, the, the purity of it. Right. Do you see that in other fighters that you think they kind of they lost why they started it and now they got famous and it's just now they're kind of in all sorts of different directions. They're not focused on their fighting or their career. And now it's can I get on this commercial? Can I get this brand? Um, I, I think I, I've seen a, a, a complete dynamic change. Uh, like we were talking about that, that, that like per the I don't know, the, the, the Facebook user brought up Jake Paul. That guy shouldn't be talked about at all. The fact that that guy is being brought up and like, uh, look, he, he has marketed himself the way he has. The fact that people like that have the ability to become famous, uh, that disgusts me. Right. Mm -hmm. Fuck Paul. So like, and you brought up your, your first professional fight, which was a year later, October 2002 for the WEC. Uh, and, and you mentioned like how you lost. Was it nerves? Was it just you were terrified when you first got in there? Because a year later in 2003, you know, you ended the guy in the first round. So, like, was it just nerves or was it just, um, you know, cold feet for your first time stepping in the cage or? I, well, first I had, I'm sorry, I had uh, uh, bronchitis. Uh, and uh, uh, my good friend Dan Camarillo <laughs> had to unfortunately share a room with me as I was coughing and hacking the whole night before the fight. Um, you know what? I I was green as hell and I was sick as shit. Um, I, took, I took Sam down uh, and I had Mount and uh, that was about all I had in the fight. 
uh, as soon as he got out of it, I had nothing left. I think I threw a lazy leg kick, and he cracked me and ended it. Um, but I, I feel like at that point in my in, in in my fighting career, that probably would have would have happened anyways. It just probably would have happened a little bit later in the fight. Um, yeah. Okay. So, and, and we brought up a topic, and we always talk about Tito Ortiz. So let's just crack on them a little bit. So like back in the early days, obviously from his win against Edmund Tanner, and then he fought against El Elvis Sinistic, and he beat Elvis Sinistic, and he was given pretty much layups. And then, you know, he, he fought against Vladimir uh, Matyushenko, the janitor. Um, and, 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 you know, obviously the writing was on the wall that Tito Ortiz was going to be the face of the company. He was obviously going to be what UFC makes the rock or Stone Cold Steve Austin. That was going to be the figurehead. Uh, so what were your first impressions? Because you met Tito Ortiz at WC, correct? Yeah. Um, so I, I look. I, I first and foremost, I, I don't give a. I don't care about anybody. Like I, I that is one thing. I, I like anyone that I've met. Like even so, like there are people that I'm I'm inspired by and that I think are exceptional martial artists. Like the first time I met Anderson Silva, like I, I he's someone that. But I'm not going to. I don't care who the hell you are. But uh, I was fighting the WC and I was introduced to Tito, and Tito's like, "Hey, how you doing? I'm Tito Ortiz." He, he used like 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 I'm supposed to know who you are and like your only reason why you're putting your last name is because you feel that you're you're you you are somebody, and I was just like you're a douchebag. You like from the first get go, and again this is he's not even, but I used to be UFC champ at that point. But like you introduced yourself as Tito Ortiz, like fuck off, really, like like really. I, I uh, he was a douchebag then, and, and nothing has changed. He's just I, I, if you can fit any more douche into that bag. Tito has done his best to try to like add more douche. He's just like that. That's an over overfilled douchebag. That guy. It's a douchebag plus. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, yeah. It's 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 seeping over that fucking guy. Yeah. <laughs> so before we talk about the fact that he's getting removed from city council and being a mayor for a vote of confidence, because we we're talking and laughing about that before. So 2002, obviously you're coming off your first fight, and then coming back in 2003, strong. And getting a whole roll of wins, we're going to talk about that. Tito Ortiz, UFC Vendetta, UFC who's been doing bad business all year long, finally gets a shot in the arm. Ken Shamrock coming off of UFC, uh, WWE fame, comes into the UFC, did Ken Shamrock versus Tito Ortiz for an old rivalry that took place as Tito Ortiz beat Guy Mesner and Jerry Bolander and all that fucking fun stuff. So Tito Ortiz, and they build up Tito Ortiz versus Chuck Liddell. Tito, Tito Ortiz, if he was going to be the figurehead, he was going to pass the, uh, the torch to Chuck Liddell because Dana White knew that Chuck Liddell was going to beat that ass. So, nevertheless, Tito Ortiz beats Ken Shamrock. Ken Shamrock, who just is coming off a loss to Don Fry. Tito Ortiz is coming off from a one-year layoff. At the end of the fight, he says, I really don't want to think about that right now because, you know, me and Chuck, we have uh, some things we got to talk about. Money, blah, 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 movie commitments. The age-old question, and going around the MMA community like you have, was Tito Ortiz ducking Chuck Liddell? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. In training, in training, Chuck beat that ass easily. I talked right. to many, many people now. I, I've never been in the room with either one of those gentlemen. I will say that. But I know many, many people that have been in the room with both of them. And both of the, everyone that I've talked to said that Tito could not do anything to Chuck. And a lot of the times... He would back away from Chuck because Chuck would be Chuck would be beating him up so bad. So it was a hundred percent a duck. And uh, like like look, it, no one wants to transfer you know uh, power. And the thing is, look, no, no disrespect to, to to Ken, even though it might sound disrespectful, but Ken his heyday had passed many many moons ago when he fought Tito, and him fighting uh, Ken twice means dick all. It's, that's as much as Matt Hughes beating Hoist. Like, really, like, I like I, that. I, look, I, I have utmost respect for Hoist. I actually trained with Hoist for the Matt Hughes camp, and I was like, he's going to get dusted. He's going to get dusted. Um, but, yeah, yeah, Tito kept beating up Ken in one of those fights because they were easy fights for him to win. And he did not want to fight Ken. He didn't want to – I'm sorry, Ken. He didn't want to fight uh, uh, Chuck. Because he didn't want to pass the torch, the torch. But the reality is, Chuck gave the UFC what they needed. They wanted a knockout artist. They wanted someone that would come in there and crack people. And that's the reality. Like that's what Chuck brought to the table. 
Gotcha. So let's let's fast forward. Ali, do you have uh, any comments, by the way? You no, know, I'd itch my eye. <laughs> okay, hold your finger because I'm gonna go fucking nerd crazy. So hold your finger. <laughs> so I, talk. I apologize. So now we're gonna fast forward to 2003. This was a fucking huge year for you because you know coming off a loss, and we're gonna go right and skip to 2003. Sorry, I actually took notes. So. So the second pro fight happened in February 2003 for the Gladiator Challenge. TKO win in one minute. What did you change in the last four months from your first fight to the second fight? What did you work on? Who did you train with? How did you make such vast improvements from your first fight into your second fight? And I know with bronchitis and sicknesses and everything like that, but what did you work on that there was such a great improvement? And also summer 2003, you also had two big wins as well, all first-round finishes. Like, what, what changed? Well, I mean, you got to understand that that time frame um, – we didn't really know what MMA is for. like. So we, I would do jiu-jitsu at one club. I go to do kickboxing in another club, and then I would do MMA sparring at the at the jiu-jitsu club. We didn't really have an idea of like. And then I would go to the gym, and I would do you know I would do uh, buys and buys and uh, uh, legs on one day, and back and chest on the other day. Like we, I didn't really have a real idea of what it took for training at that point. Um, I just went back to training, and uh, uh, you know I. I I will say that we trained really, really hard at that point. Um, we sparred a lot. That if there's one thing about that time frame is is you every every uh, every session was basically you were you were fighting like you you know you'd go to an you do a, a an MMA practice and all that was is okay we beat the fuck out of each other for an hour. Um, I don't think there's anything different about it to be honest. I I just I felt like. Uh, I, I, I needed to get a fight back because I really felt that I didn't get to show what I had, and I also felt that uh, um, I that I think that's the only difference, to be honest. I, I can't think of anything that was like I didn't. It's like oh, I'm going to change things up. I, at that point, I had no concept of changing anything up. And to be honest, I felt like I'm going to fight that fight, and that fight's going to be it. Because uh, the first fight, I felt like the bronchitis uh, played a part in it. And the reality is, maybe the first fight, if I would have won that, that might have been it. But I, but then again, I, I don't know because it, it was there's something exhilarating about it. There's something uh, primal and, and very real about fighting that I, I can't explain to someone that has never done it. Right. So skipping ahead to 2004, and Alex, just hold up your finger when you want to have a comment. So, <laughs> by the way, we're going to fast forward because obviously we want to run out of time, and I don't want to run out of time. So, like, skipping ahead to 2004, and before that, you know, he or she finally comes back. Randy Couture stinks that ass. I'm sure Gabe was very, very happy, and the MMA community was happy about that. Beautiful. And before Beautiful. that, Chuck Liddell, Chuck Liddell fighting Randy Couture, they considered Randy Couture to be washed up. Like, he he lost to Rico Rodriguez at heavyweight. He lost to Josh Barnett at heavyweight. So I, I have no idea why they would consider Randy Couture to be a layup for Chuck Liddell, because obviously they were trying to pass the, the belt to Chuck Liddell to fight Tito Ortiz and corner him. And, like, you met Randy Couture, correct? Uh, yeah, you know what? My second fight ever, uh, Nate Corey uh, uh, was on was on the same card as I was, and uh, Randy Couture uh, uh, cornered Nate at Gladiator Challenge, and that's the first time I met him. And he was a super nice guy, uh, and uh, yeah, Randy's uh, uh, you know I, the first time I ever I, in the I'm very very fortunate that I've actually uh, met up with Nate Corey on on a number of occasions past that, uh, but the first yeah my second fight ever, uh, Randy Couture, and this is at a podunk India casino in the middle of nowhere uh, in Porterville. Uh, Randy, Randy Couture was uh, cornering Nate, Nate Quarry. Awesome. So yeah. in 2004, big year for you. You had a TKO win over Cody Reeds at IFC. Uh, then a submission win to earn a UFC world title shot two months later against a crappy pride and MMA veteran and BJJ black belt, Olaf Alfonso. You won the arena like a choke to win your first world title. And winning your first world title, was it gratifying knowing the journey that you started all those years ago finally paid off? You had this world title. And, you know, how did it feel, like, being on top of a division in uh, the WC? Well, the WC wanted Olaf to be the, 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 the champion. I mean, uh, if you've ever seen Olaf fight, he is a wild man. And he, like, his nose is, is over here because he throws with reckless abandonment. And uh, if you ever – if it got if, – if, if you want to see just like a rock'em sock'em bloodfest, him versus John Palakowski 
in the WC is one of those fights where you're just like they just sit in front of each other, punching each other in the face. And they wanted they wanted all off to win. And he had just beaten uh, a, a, a couple guys who were, who were who were really good, but they wanted all off to be the face of the WC because he had just uh, he had lost a decision to uh, uh, Gil Gil Melendez, um, and he who was actually the first uh, 55 pound champion. Um, and so they they wanted they wanted Olaf to be the champion, and um, taking him out uh, and becoming the champion was kind of surreal. I never, again, you have to understand that I didn't start this to be a champion. I didn't start this to make it a career. I did it because I was afraid. You know what I mean? And uh, to come to become a, a champion of, of the WC, and especially at that time frame, uh, I I was just in complete shock. I, I mean. Uh, I had broke my hand in, in the in the fight and uh, um, and I had torn my cornea uh, and I was in pain, but I was also just on cloud nine. Awesome. So you're now the world champion, and meanwhile in the UFC, because your careers are going to cross paths shortly. So meanwhile in the UFC, Tito Ortiz finally fights Chuck Liddell in a long-awaited duel. How happy were you when you saw Tito Ortiz get dropped by Chuck Liddell finally? I, I was there live actually. And it was it was a thing of beauty. Uh, it was <laughs> it, uh, it was uh, actually. I mean, you like the the at that point. Um, I think there's there's two fights in my mind for UFC that that like, and they're actually both Chuck Liddell um, that I that I saw live. That like the 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 aura in the room was just out of control. And I gotta say, uh, Chuck versus Tito and Chuck versus Vanderlei are two live shows that I like. You felt the whole place was just on fire. And when Chuck knocked out Tito, oh, it was gratifying. Did you see the part where Tito Ortiz threw his hat in the crowd and they threw it right back, by the way? I did remember that, yes. And I loved it. And I loved it. Oh, God, yeah. When the crowd returned to Unequivocally, a <laughs> Tito beater. Okay? And really, like, genuinely, I'm a Tito hater. I have no problem saying that. And it's like I, it's not. I, I don't. I don't want ill will for him. I don't. I don't want his family to suffer. But I just don't like that guy at all. Right. Yeah. And another. Another like little nerd question. So like this is the first time I saw like celebrities in the crowd. Like George Clooney was in the crowd apparently. Michael Clark, God rest his soul, and Juliet Lewis. So, you know, celebrities are finally getting on the bandwagon. And then I did my research. You were actually in a video, and I told my girlfriend about this. You were in a video with Paris Hilton. Is that correct? Oh, that was yeah, real. I was, uh, yeah, I did. I, I worked with Paris. I worked with Paris uh, privately for about uh, I don't know three or four lessons. Um, but um, privately, the the one lesson um, there was an, one one particular lesson where she's like, "Oh, you know, I want to do it at this park, and there might be I, there might be celeb there there might be a, a, a paparazzi there." And I got there, and they had everything already set up, and I'm like. Okay, this is express. You, you had this set up in advance. Like this is not, this is not impromptu. Like you're pretending it is, um, and it actually made a, a quite a stir. I mean, um, I, I I'm a, a, a half I'm half German, half uh, a, a Jew, a Russian Jewish descent. My German relative sent me a, 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 a magazine from uh, Germany, like yeah, you know, like uh, the, the the gossip magazines. Of, a, of like a two-page layout of me of me holding bats for a uh, 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 Paris, um, but yeah, so I, I did uh, I think three or four uh, private sessions with her. Well, does she naturally talk like that, or does she fake it? Uh, talk like a moron? No, that's real. <laughs> no, the, like the squeak voice. I don't know about a squeak voice. She's just a fucking idiot. I look. look <laughs> I. I, I, I uh, the only here's the, the 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 takeaway from that is she paid me three hundred fifty dollars an hour. I do about maybe fifteen minutes of pad holding for her, and then she would like talk to her assistant or play with her stupid little dog or and then oh I gotta go I gotta do something else. And I mean at that point like pay me three fifty an hour. I, I as a matter of fact I I take that back. Paris if you're watching this video which you're not, um, I take back what I said. You are a brilliant brilliant woman. And if you want to work again, hit me up. <laughs> for four I both and I got into this big conversation. Oh, I'm sorry, Ali. What were you saying? I'm so sorry for interrupting. No, She's I just talking about the inflation. It's 450. Yeah, that was a long time ago, and money is different now. 
Yeah, yeah, that's true. Good point. Good my, point. My girlfriend was uh, having this conversation with me that Kara Taylor is actually smart and she's a crappy businesswoman. And we're having this conversation. So my girlfriend's probably watching. So love you. So uh, let's go. No, I, I will say this. She is not smart. Now, I like, I, 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 <laughs> I look, she, I will say that, that I, you know, she's, done, she's done an exceptional job of marketing herself. Um, and look, who is she? She's just a, a rich girl. That's like nothing else. Like there's, you know, and look, it, she, Kim Kardashian, she, her being friends with Kim Kardashian and then Kim Kardashian having a sex tape blew up Kim. So like in reality, like if you're going to go into it, I mean, Kim Kardashian should uh, be thanking uh, uh, Paris for, you know, sucking that, that, that D on the, on the film. She <laughs> paved the way for the rest of them. Bingo. Groundbreaking. All right, my girlfriend's gonna beat my ass. So let's switch subjects back to you, Gabe. Okay, so like 2005 was a very successful year for Mr. Gabe. Two successful title defenses in the WEC and armbar win in King of the Cage. Uh, so, so Sam Wells ended your streak of finishes, won that fight by decision. What, why was he such a tough fight? You know, you were going on this hot streak of just finishing people. What made him such a tough fight? And what, well, like. So Sam is my loss, my first loss. Right. So, and Sam is really, really tough. And I actually, I'm still friends with Sam. Um, I've seen him at UFC events uh, back in the day. Uh, he's a tough, tough dude. He's one of those, uh, I, you know, he'd be considered a journeyman, but like Sam is just a tough dude. Um, the first round, I, I was winning decisively. The second round, he dropped me. I had to fight back hard. Uh, and then the, the third round, uh, I did everything in my, in my power to finish him. I just could not do it. And, uh, I mean, it was a good fight, and I think the best part about it was um, up to that point, I think I was finishing fights pretty fast, so I never had an opportunity to really see what, like, inner fortitude I had, and Sam, he brought it, man. I, I like, he, he, Sam's an unsung hero in the respect that, like, you know, any anyone, uh, uh, mainstream fans aren't going to know who Sam Wells is, but there are a lot of guys out there that are genuinely tough, tough, badass dudes that on any given day can beat you. So now we're going to go to finally the UFC makes some headway, goes mainstream. Uh, yeah. the, the Fighter Season 1 aired on Spike TV. What was your overall opinions on the show, uh, the announcement that MMA was going to take the reality TV route? Uh, I have my own opinions. I, I thought that it was a good for educational purposes on the sport, but not enough fights also. I didn't like the goofy, let's highlight Chris Lee been drinking, and, like, I didn't like that shit. Nevertheless, it's not about me. So, like, going to you, what was your overall opinions about it, and what was the MMA community like? Because um, we know that it all fits in. I remember hearing about, like, uh, who they had casted, and there's a lot of, like, uh, huh, who? You know what I mean? Like, as far as, like, uh, at that point, that that time frame of, of MMA fighters, like, they're, like, there are a lot of guys now that, that have since become – uh, like I think Forrest Griffin was the one name that that I had heard because he had done it uh, the like a IB, uh, IFC tournament. IFC, um, IFC. Yeah. Uh, um, but overall, the and I knew Nate because uh, you know him and I had fought on the, on my second uh, my second fight ever. Um, but like I, I I watched Chris Liebman's fight, so I knew who he was because uh, he fought uh, uh, Mike Swick. But there are a lot of guys like like uh, Diego Sanchez and uh, Kenny Florian and. And there are a lot of guys that we still don't even know. Like uh, I, Chris Sanford, I actually became friends with later, but, but there are a bunch of guys to this day that I still, you know, can't remember who they are. But um, outside of the casting, being like kind of confused about the casting, I thought it was great because I mean, you know, I, the opportunity for any exposure at that point was a good thing. I certainly didn't think that it was going to be the catalyst that it was. You know, I mean, I remember watching the the finale. And being like, oh, like th those are good fights, uh, especially the Forrest Griffin, uh, Stephen Bonner fight, and being like that—that that was a fucking great fight. But I didn't think it was going to do what it did, and uh, I mean, it fucking blew up. Strange Brew. I had a theory about Strange Brew that they brought in. Uh, uh, so Strange Brew was this guy that they randomly brought in. This guy from Canada. Uh, he had uh, apparently smoker fights, and he did very well. And they brought him in, and he's kind of like a. a kind of like a fish out of water. He ended up fighting Chris Lieben at the finale. Chris Lieben lit him up. I, I thought Chris, uh, like Strange Brew and some of the guys that they brought in was just to show what's the difference between an ultimate fighter and what's the difference between like just regular Joe Schmo. Do you agree? Do you disagree? 
Um, I, you know what? I, I think that they, they wanted to put together a cast. And one thing that I, that, I, that I learned from going for the ultra fighter myself is that's what they're doing. They're not like the fighting is, is, is a part of it, obviously, but they're bringing in like, it's, it's a show. They, they want the entertainment factor. So, um, I, when we had Chris on the show, uh, what, like what, about three weeks ago, Chris was saying that they wanted him immediately. He's a character. Of course they wanted him on there. I'll be honest, like, so when I was on the Ultimate Fighter, there were other people that, that had their way of getting on. I sat down with the producer for coffee and she was just like, I'm going to tell you, like, you're not going to do anything else. We're going to, you're going to go through the whole process with everybody, but, but you're pretty much already there uh, because you're a personality. And that's what they want, you know, more than, than, than like the fighting is secondary, really. And I mean, don't get me wrong. There are some some fucking exceptional fighters that have come from from uh, uh, the Ultimate Fighter. And my season, I feel that we had a, like, a really solid, good grouping of fighters. But uh, um, it's TV. So TV is uh, uh, far more important than the actual aspect of fighting. Right. So, and Ali, do you have any questions? I'm so sorry for taking up. That was fine. I know you're in your own itinerary, but yeah, and I can totally see Gabe's point where it's a problem because yeah, they want a personality on there, and then these guys that already have that douchebag personality, it just gets even more inflated. It's like this show wants me. I must be such a great athlete, and it just blows their head up even more. And all reality was, they're like, "You're a fucking idiot," and people are gonna want to see what you say. More or so, less. More or less. I mean, so. Like, uh, uh, so it, an interesting uh, uh, a caveat to the, the whole Ultimate Fighter. Um, so they put us in a, a van when I went, to, we, you do medical tests. And the guy driving the, the van is actually, uh, he's one of the uh, uh, producers. And he's sitting there watching us and, and introduce, like, he's just pretending like he's just driving us. But in reality, he's seeing us how we interact. And he's like, oh, those two guys fucking hate each other. Those two guys, two guys are talking shit. These two guys are this and that. They, like So they're actually uh, driving us around. One of the producers is driving us around. We don't know at the time. We just think it's the driver, right? And uh, so he's doing his background to figure out who's going to fit into the house to make controversy and to make things good. Like, for instance, Matt Wyman and I, we hated each other from the bus. We hated each other because he, he started talking shit about uh, a couple of close friends of mine. And uh, I wanted to fight him right there, right then and there. And so there was already a risk that they're like, yeah, we're going to get these two guys in the house because they're going to hate each other. Of course. Why wouldn't you? Unbelievable. And by the way, around uh, the end of 2006, before we get into 2000, um, yeah, in 2005, actually, before we get into uh, 2006. So Chuck Liddell finally winning the UFC light heavyweight championship. It was one of the biggest buy rates in UFC history at that time. It was the, the biggest side. Brief question. Did you ever meet Chuck Liddell? Did you ever have an interaction with him? Yeah, I've met Chuck many times. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, you know, met- very nice guy. I have nothing bad to say about Chuck. The only bad thing I will say about Chuck is I wish he would not have taken that last fight against Tito. Uh, I felt that, that was criminal that was criminal by his, his training partners and the commission and anyone that allowed that fight to happen. Outside that, I, I hold Chuck in a high regard. Right. And I... And just to put it in perspective, Gabe's generation, Forrest Griffin and I, we met in 2013. I sat down with Forrest Griffin. I was talking about his fights in the WF, uh, the IFC, like his fights with uh, Dan Severin. And he didn't even know what the fuck I was talking about. He didn't even remember until, like, I showed him my phone. So, you know, this generation, Gabe's generation, fought through fucking wars, period. So I just wanted to add that tidbit. So now we go on to 2006. We would face a tough task. Uh, talk to me about the Hermo, uh, Hermes Burroughs fight. Uh, Hermes Franca? Franca, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I felt ready to, to, to step up, and I, and I wanted to fight. Uh, I kept uh, the, the, the uh, WBC. The, so they'd asked me to fight uh, Jason Maxwell, who just knocked out Jens Pulver, and he was like, uh, and that the people are going to believe this, but I, or I, they, I hope they believe it, but Jens Pulver was the number one fighter in the world at that point. And yep. Jason Maxwell knocked him out. So I beat Jason. And they're like, your next, your next person has to be a name. And I said, fine, give me a name. I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly okay uh, to, to, to test myself and see where I'm at. And they, they threw out Hermes. And I said, yeah, that's a good fight. Let's go. Um, the, uh, I'd watch uh, tape on Hermes, but apparently Hermes, uh, at, that, at the, the tape that I watched, he wasn't motivated. Uh, and 
apparently he decided to really step it up and he was trained with a uh, Kurt Pellegrino and, and a bunch of other tough, tough guys. And, uh, he came prepared and I felt like I could do it. And, uh, it was not my night. Uh, he clipped me. And I, I so a, a couple things, you know, the, this is the first, uh, California commission fight for the WEC. Um, and the fight right before me, Rob McCullough fought Olaf Alfonso and killed him. Not literally, but like hit him, hit him, dropped him and then got on top of him and just fucking drilled him in the face. Uh, the commission was like, if anything else happens, uh, so, so to give you uh, pull back a little bit, I'm in the, uh, I'm warming up, get, I'm already in like the, the, the doing my getting ready for my walk, and uh, Rob knocks out uh, uh, Olaf, and it is a bad knockout where the commission comes in, the EMTs come in. I'm sitting in the cold waiting for the fight to happen, and I'm, this is not me making any excuse for the fight. This is just me telling you what happened. Um, and uh, it was. It took us probably about 20 minutes before they allowed the fights to keep happening. And the commission said, if there's one more thing like this, we're calling the whole show. And so the WC says, uh, I went into the fight. Um, Josh Rosen's always the ref, who's a, a good ref um, and a good friend of mine. Uh, and Hermes dropped me. And Josh admittedly said that he rushed in. I felt I could have kept fighting. Um, I got dropped, and um, who knows? He probably could have just done more damage to me. But um, uh, it absolutely uh, uh, – he rocked, rocked me, and then he went on a run that got him to the UFC title. He beat Nate Diaz after me. He beat uh, three or four other guys before uh, fighting Sean Shirk and losing for the UFC title. So, I mean, it was Hermes on fire, and I, I wasn't uh, as as uh, ready as I should have been. And – that's just what it was, you know, on that day. But I will say this, that is one of the fights I regret the most because Hermes turned out to be a pedophile and a rapist. And yeah. the fact that I lost that piece of shit. Right. And Hermes got put away for, I think it's like four or five years and they got deported back to Brazil. Yeah. 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 So, um, <laughs> Justin Sims, I love you brother. And he asked, what's your, uh, you know, we're running out of time. We got three minutes left. I was about to get to your UFC debut. So obviously we've got to wrap it up and get to part so two. Or, yeah, this close, this close. So <laughs> Justin Sims, I love you. That's a great question. He was asking what's your favorite thing and least favorite thing about me, Matt, and Justin Sims. So, I, You know, the, the thing I, I miss the most or the thing that I, I, I have the biggest issue with is that Justin Sims, who's the one who, who's like, hey, you want to do this podcast? He doesn't do it anymore. And I miss that guy. I miss him so much. It hurts me every night. I go to sleep crying to my wife. Like, I need Justin Sims back in my life, but he doesn't want me anymore. And I feel like the dejected girlfriend that's just been thrown to the side. Like a used shop ring. Like he talked you into moving and then dumped you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So we're at two minutes. We're, we're running out of time. So, obviously, uh, I wanted to get into your win against uh, Sabin Yun and then going into your UFC debut. Obviously, we got to save this for part two because I got quite – Gabe, I was so excited. I was at fucking work. I was typing this up. I got all the way up to 2013. So, like, literally chronologically ordered this entire fucking thing. I was that so excited. So, this could be like a three-parter. Three-parter. I, I know. This, I think I, I – I, I, let, me, let me answer the question from the Facebook uh, – uh, uh, Jake Paul is a joke. Um, I have actually had a couple of students that have gone and in, in, in trained with him, uh, very low-level guys, uh, um, and they bring in people from the Valley to be his, his sparring partner uh, to, to build his confidence, and they make him sign a, no, a, a, no, uh, a non-disclosure co uh, contract. Um, and if they do good with him, they, they, they throw the footage away, and if they, if they do bad against him, they utilize the footage. Um, Jake Paul is a little piece of shit, and if it was up to me, I would smash his face right now. And he has no no option. He like the fact that he is making money, and that 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 people even talk to him. That I'm asking that I'm being asked a question about that guy drives me fucking insane. Right, and the fact that Jake Paul is the biggest piece of shit of all time. And by the way, you can add his mom at Pam bottom slash Stepnik. You can add up his mom because. He, he fucking added uh, Ben Askren's wife and started harassing her. Like, he's a, so, the biggest piece of shit. So, I hope he gets his fucking ass kicked. Fuck Jake Paul. Biggest piece of shit. Did not earn it. He fucking got to the main event, never knowing what the fuck talent means. 
Fuck that guy. Fuck that so, piece of shit. So, oh, Jake Paul, uh, this is going to be a boxing match, right? Correct. Fuck that yeah. piece of shit. Fuck and, that guy. And he's got somebody that knocked out Ben with a knee training him for boxing. I mean, makes sense to me. I mean, see, I'm like, look, get the fuck out of here. But look, look, that that guy, he's not he's not real. He's that he's doing this expressly for for likes and for for like look, we, we've gotten to the age where 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 that that is more important than than, than actual fighting. And look, well, that's a- on the other side, he's making way more money than I ever made in any fight that I had. So I I mean, what can I say? You know what I mean? Like being a joke, he's making way more money than I ever made in my fight. So you know what? Slow clap for Jake Paul. Uh-huh. That's, like, that's the thing with some of these guys. They're getting by by just being obnoxious shitholes, and they're making grudge matches because nobody actually wants to put them on a card until they find a real fighter and poke at them until that fighter says, hey, match me up with them. I'm tired of him talking shit, and that's how they can get on cards. So, I mean, they kind of, I mean, they're marketing themselves in their own way because they're that's just shit crazy. fighters that can't get on cards. Yeah, well, the thing, like, like I, I think one of my, 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 my least favorite things is these shit fighters that talk about, like, oh, this guy is ducking me, this guy's ducking me. You, you're irrelevant, and you're going to get knocked out whatever fight you have, and then you're going to go to obscurity. Uh, but, but, like, this is what you do, and this is how you build yourself up. And, and you know what? I, what the fuck can I do? I, I'm, I'm a 43-year-old man that runs a school, and I don't really I, – I, you know, I, I'm involved in MMA, but I'm not involved in it anymore. But uh, uh, if if we were going to say that, I feel like going back from fighting where where fighting was real and, and raw and pure to what we are now, uh, all of the fame, all of the money, it's it's all for naught, to be honest. Right. And so we're gonna time this out, and I'm gonna make this a nice leeway to part two because Gabe and that entire generation. The reason why I want to talk to Gabe in the first place because it's my fucking favorite generation of MMA. They didn't fight for Instagram likes. Didn't fight for Facebook. There was no Facebook, no Instagram. Maybe MySpace, like Zanga. I don't know, some other fucking shit. But they fought for fucking glory, and they put the spore on their fucking back. These guys fighting wars after wars that most of these little motherfuckers like Jake Paul never fucking watched, never studied, and never fucking idolized like I fucking did. And these little motherfuckers don't know what it's like to fight throughout the entire journey. Fight the entire journey. Go through the process. And, you know, you got – you ain't – you are a perfect example. You had no social media whatsoever. You fought for the love of the game. And maybe, maybe you would land on television, which you fucking did because you deserved it. So, final words. I hope I wrap that up like a Christmas present correctly. I hope so. I, I, I hope, I hope it, it, gave, it gave someone some insight into that time period. I have no problem talking about it. it it's, it's, it's fun for me. Uh, there are people that are far better fighters than I am that, that, that are icons in the sport. I was talking to you about this earlier, but, uh, I, if, if I give this game some insight to some people, then, then, uh, I have no problem doing part two. Uh, but it's always fun talking to you guys and, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Fuck yeah. Final thoughts, Alan. I, I, um, I'm glad to be a part of it and learn more about Gabe because I mean, I didn't realize how long of a history Gabe had in the sport. I was like, I'm, not as an encyclopedia as David is, and I'm glad really? I got to sit in this. I learned quite a bit, and it's actually interesting. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, David, like, what about was... this tweet you made in the year 2005? <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I, I fought this sport my entire life, and Gabe was a big part of it. And again, I was starstruck you know, the first time. Matt was like, "Oh, fucking Gabe Ruligard is going to be your fucking Godzilla is going to be your fucking co-host." I'm like. I, I'm not qualified to fucking be like Gabe being my co-host, like no fucking way. Like, so I was completely starstruck. Our first interview, I apologize. So that for months I've been itching. I'm like, Gabe would send me stories and he talk about the Gracies and talk about his stories on the road, like partying with NFL players and fucking these after parties. I'm like, Gabe, we have to do a fucking ask Gabe episode. I have to ask. All you right, fucking side note, questions. Gabe, blink twice if you're starting to feel a little uncomfortable around David now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad that there's, there's two coats between us. <laughs> That's comfortable for me. That there's this whole midsection that keeps David away. <laughs> Fair enough, sir. Fair enough. So, we're going to wrap this up. I want to uh, join us for part two uh, in two weeks. Me and Matt are going to be down in Florida covering uh, 
going to be down in Florida with Matt. We're going to be interviewing all the players. It's going to be fucking awesome. Part two will be coming in two weeks. And also join Ali's show, the, the A show, next Wednesday. Uh, it's going to be awesome. So, ladies and gentlemen. And you guys can come on our show, show too. Wait, what? I'm you guys come on, Matt, on our Alex. show, too. I'm just always kind of like sitting in on your guys's. I have I, I, all I do is ask. You don't understand. Like I, I, I'm nobody. You kidding me? All I do is ask me. I'll say yes. And I'm like, 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 what else am I gonna do? Uh, Matt. Uh, Matt looks like he wants to talk this whole time, though. Go ahead, Matt. I just want on a, on a second episode. I, I definitely want to find out more about your gym and how you started it, and, and uh, more of what's going on there. Fuck yeah. Happy to talk about that. I love that shit. That's my that's my jam, son. I like how your whole like start was kind of more like a spiritual journey of just like getting over your fear of fighting, and then it just kind of like skyrocketed. Uh, I mean that that's the truth of it. I mean, I, you know, I I, I wish that. Uh, well, I, it's again the the time period is is a time frame. It was illegal. I had to fight. I had to fight on an Indian reservation. I couldn't fight in a real, you know, sanctioned bout that anyone knew about. So yeah, it was a diff different animal, different different time frame, different. Uh, Different animal. Awesome sauce. So, from Matt, the producer, Ali, my MMA crush Monday, Gabe, we'll see you for part two of the episode <laughs> in the next two weeks. Ladies and yeah. gentlemen, signing up from the fight mixer. Peace out. Bye, Dios. Perfect. Perfect. Perfect.